Hello students, welcome to the channel. In today's video, we will be solving the calculator section, the math cal section of the April 2021 SAT. I've already uploaded a video in which I solved the no cal section. So let's begin. Question one, um, Shelly spent $235 to rent a moving van. The equation above shows the relationship between the number of days she rented the van and the number of miles she drove the van. If she rented the van for three days, how many miles did she drive the van? Okay, so the equation is 20D plus 0.7M is 235, where 235 is the total amount that uh, Shelley spent. Now, D is the number of days, which is given as three. So 20 into three plus 0.7M is 235. So 60 plus 0.7M is 235. So 0.7M is 235 minus 60, which is uh, 175. So M is 175 divided by 0 .7, 0 0.7, which we can plug into the calculator. Um, 170, yeah, 175 divided by 0 0.7, which comes to 250. So M is 250. So uh, Shelly, uh, drove 250 miles, option B. So let's choose that. Um, yeah. Okay, option B. Yeah. Uh, question two. Uh, what is the solution to the given system of equations? So X is three and Y is X plus three. Right, so x we already know is 3 and y is x plus 3, so that's 3 plus 3, which is 6. So 3, comma 6 is going to be the solution, option A. Okay, option A. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can, yeah, let me choose a lighter one, yeah. Okay, number three, fx is minus 0.5x plus 56. The given function models the average daily temperature in degrees Fahrenheit in Chicago x days after November 1 for uh, x between 0 and 29. Based on this model, what is the average daily temperature in Fahrenheit in Chicago six days after November 1? So x is six, right? Because uh, it is six days after November 1. So f of six will be a negative 0.5 x plus 56, where x is six. So negative 0.5 into six plus 56, and that's negative three plus 56. So that's 53. So the temperature in Chicago six days after November one is 53, option D. Yeah, okay. The table gives some values of uh, X and their corresponding values of FX. Uh, which of the following graphs could be the function of Y is equal to FX in the XY plane? Okay, so I'm just going to write those values, minus two, zero, minus one, zero. Um, right, so I'm just writing them here, minus two, zero minus one zero zero comma negative two and one comma zero so i have all these values right now i can work on the options um so in the first graph at minus two it is zero at minus one, it's not zero. So the first graph I can cancel out. Yeah, okay, number two. At minus two, it is not zero. So I can cancel out the second one. 
Okay, in the third graph at minus two and minus one, it's zero. And at zero, it is negative two. Uh, and at one, it is zero. So this clearly is the correct answer. And in the fourth graph at minus two, it is not zero. So the right answer here is C. Okay, uh, number six, an automobile uses 27 pints of fuel for every 63 miles traveled. How many pints of fuel does the automobile use to travel? Seven miles. So let the number of pints of fuel for seven miles be X then 27 over x is 63 over 7. This is a simple ratio question. So 7 into 9 is 63. So x is 27 over 9, which is 3. So 3 pints of fuel for 7 miles. Option D. Okay. Uh, yeah. How many fluid ounces are equivalent to 40 cups of liquid? Um, eight fluid ounces is one cup, I imagine, right? That I can't read that, but it's one cup. So, um, one cup is oh, wait, uh, oh, like that. Okay, so I'll just cancel this and I'll write with the annotation tool. Yeah, so one cup is uh, eight fluid ounces, right? So 40 cups would be eight into 40 fluid ounces, which is 320 fluid ounces. So the answer is D. Okay, so that's, that's D. What percentage of 40 is 15? Um, so 15 divided by 40 into 100. Zeros cancel. Um, two twos are four, two fives are 10. So 75 by two, which is 37.5%. So 37.5% option B. Okay. Uh, one second, option B, okay. Uh, questions eight and nine refer to the following information. For a sample of 13 red alder trees, an arborist measured each tree's diameter in centimeters at a height of 1.4 meters. The arborist then counted the number of growth rings at this height. Each point in the scatter plot represents the diameter of number of rings for each tree. Line of best fit for the data is shown. <clears throat> a red alder tree will be selected at random from the sample. What is the probability that the selected tree will have a measured diameter that is greater than 30 centimeters? Right. So greater than 30 centimeters, how many trees are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right. So out of the 13 trees, seven trees have a diameter greater than 30. So the answer is seven over 13. For how many of the trees in the sample is the number of growth rings greater than the number predicted by the line of best fit? So the number of growth rings is greater than the number predicted by the line of best fit, which means that the point has to be above the line. Right. Because see, if you look at, um, let's say the first point, at diameter of 11, the actual value is 10, but the line predicts something like 9, right? So all the points above the line have to be counted. So 3, um, 4, we have to look at only greater than, right? Yeah, so we won't include the one on the line. So it's 3, 4 five, six, right? There are six points which are above the line, so greater than, uh, yeah. So six is the answer, yeah, okay. So that's option C. The volume of a neodymium magnet is 2.5 cubic centimeters and its mass is 18.5 uh, grams. 
what is the density in grams per cubic centimeter? So density is mass over volume, 18.5 divided by 2.5, right? Because we have the mass is 18.5 and the volume is 2.5. So let's plug that in. 18.5 divided by 2.5, that's 7.4. So the volume is, uh, the density is 7.4, option B. Okay. The given list shows a baseball team score for each of its uh, first 10 games. Okay. In the 11th game, the team had a score of 18. Which of the following best describes the mean and median of the team's score for the first 11 games compared to the first 10 games? So this is for the first 10 games. And then in the 11th one, they had a score of 18, right? So if you look at the median first, let's understand the median. What was the median for these 10 values? It would be the average of the fifth and sixth values, right? Uh, average. So what is the fifth value? One, two, three, four, five. So five and five. So the average is five. So the median is five. Now for the 11 values, uh, the median will be the sixth value right? Because it's an odd number. So we will just add one and divide by two. So 11 plus one divided by two is the sixth value. And that's, um, that's five. So the median does not change, right? Now, think about it. The mean will definitely increase, right? Because this is like a huge number compared to the others. 18 is like a huge number compared to the others. So earlier, the sum of the 10 numbers uh, is going to be less, much less than the sum of the 11 data points, right? And so the mean will be pushed to the right. So the median does not change, but the mean increases. So that is um, uh, option A. The mean increased, but the median remains unchanged. Okay, so that's option A. <clears throat> The scatter plot shows 10 values from a data set. Which of the following equations is the most appropriate linear model for the data show? Okay, so if you just try and make like a rough approximation of how the line of best fit could look, so it would have to go something like this, right? Something like that, like not very accurate, but something like that. So, you can see that um, the y-intercept is somewhere here, close to 10, right? So I'm looking at options with the y-intercept close to 10. And uh, my slope, my slope has to be something like, uh, this is five by 10. So my slope is something close to half. So I'm looking at answer possibility where the y-intercept is close to 10 and the slope is close to half. So let's look at the possibilities here. So it's definitely not C and D, right? Because it is the line is not going to pass through the origin. It definitely has a y-intercept. And between A and B, you can see that B has a negative slope and that's not possible because it's a rising line, it's going up. So it needs to have a positive slope. And so the best answer is option A, right? The values, the value for y-intercept is close to what we assumed, but for M, we assumed 0.5, but the answer is 0.3. But that's okay because they didn't expect you to calculate exact values. They wanted you to look at whether there would be a y-intercept or not. And since there is, then C and D are out and whether the slope is positive or not. So they are more interested in that than the exact values. So the answer is option A. Okay, so let's choose A for this. Mm, triangles A, B, C, and D, E, F each have a corresponding angle measuring 40 degrees. 
which additional piece of information is sufficient to determine whether these two triangles are similar. The length of line segment AC, the length of line segment DE, the measure of another pair of corresponding angles in the two triangles, the lengths of one pair of corresponding sides in the two triangles. So when we talk about similarity, similarity is the fact that two triangles will have the same shape, but not necessarily the same size. So if I have A, B, C, and D, E, F, and I know that one pair of corresponding angles are 40 degrees each. So if I know another pair of corresponding angles in the two triangles, let's say C and F, and if they are equal, then by the AA property, the two triangles would be similar, right? So just another pair of corresponding angles is enough. Now, if you just have the length of a line segment in the first or the second triangle, that doesn't prove anything because for similarity, the ratio of the corresponding sides have to be equal. So just having one side from <clears throat> uh, one triangle or another side from another triangle doesn't help. And even if I have a pair of corresponding sides in the two triangles, that doesn't tell me anything unless I have uh, something to compare it to because the ratios of corresponding sides have to be equal. So if I have another pair of corresponding angles, then I can prove similarity. So C is the right answer for this. Okay, and then if three times X by five plus one by two plus one is T, what is the value of X by five plus one by two? So let x plus x by 5 plus 1 by 2 be t, then we have 3t plus 1 is 10. So 3t is 9. So t is 3. So they've asked us the value of t. So the answer is 3. Okay. <clears throat> The graph of the exponential function f is shown for what value of x is fx zero. So you can see fx is zero when x is negative two, right? Because minus two comma zero is a point on the graph. So the x intercept is negative two and that's the value of x for which fx is zero. So that would be a negative two option C. <clears throat> The half-life of the radioactive isotope iodine-131 is approximately eight days, which means that at the end of each eight-day time interval, only half of the mass of the isotope that was present at the beginning of the time interval remains. Which of the following best describes how the amount of iodine-131 changes over time? So if you plot this, you will notice that it will be exponential decay. Why? Because let's say I start with the 1600 uh, micrograms or something. Then after eight days, I would have uh, 800 micrograms. After another eight days, I would have uh, 400 micrograms. After another eight days, I would be left with let's say 200 micrograms. So I can see that my initial curve, the initial drop would be significant, but as the amount of isotope decreases, the curve becomes flatter and that's exponential decay. So that's uh, option D. Okay. In question 17, in the XY plane, a circle with radius 2 has center 0, 0. Which of the following is the equation of the circle? So the general equation of the circle on the coordinate plane is given by X minus H the whole squared plus Y minus K the whole squared is R squared, where H comma K is the center of the circle and R is the radius of the circle. So here h and k are zero. So x minus zero whole squared plus y minus zero whole squared and radius is two, so two squared. So x squared plus y squared is 
4. So that's option B. Okay, so let's mark B. If X satisfies the given equation, which of the following could be a value of X plus 3? So let's um, write this. Let's first try and solve this, right? So I know that um, I can split the middle term x squared plus 3x minus x minus 3 is 0. So x plus 3 into x minus 1 is 0. So x is negative 3 or 1. So those are the values of x. So x plus 3 can be 0 or 4. So from the options, 0 is the right answer. So that's option C. Okay. Question 19. Um, the table shows the results of a poll of 1,000 people. Respondents were asked to agree or disagree with the statement. I rely too much on my phone. If a respondent who was selected at random disagrees with the statement. So... Which of the following is closest to the probability that the res respondent selected is at least 45 years old? So in table probability questions, you need to choose your denominator and numerator based on the question, what the question is asking. So if a respondent who was selected at random disagrees with the statement. So here I'm looking at the total number of people who disagree. So that's my denominator, 548. And out of this group, which is closest to the probability that the respondent is at least 45 years old. So I'm looking at people who are greater than 45, right? 45 and above 45. So that's 201 plus 102, which is 303. So the required probability would be 303 by 548, which <clears throat> which I can plug into the calculator. 303 divided by 548, which is 0 0.55. 0 0.55. So that's the answer. Uh, 0 0.55, which is option uh, D. So D is my answer. Okay, the table above shows several values of uh, X and their corresponding values of y, where k is a non-zero constant. Uh, if the relationship between x and y is linear, which of the following defines this relationship? Okay, so I just wanted to write down the values clearly. So when x is negative one, y is, uh, is it minus? It's a little confusing, no? I think it's, yeah, it's minus 2k minus 2. Yeah. But I'll just write it as <clears throat> the this thing with the annotation. Yeah. I think this is the table. So I'm just going to write it here. When this is x and this is y. So when x is negative 1, y is minus 2k minus 2. When x is 0, y is 0. When x is 1, y is 2k plus uh, 24. And when x is 2, y is k plus 4, I think. Yeah. So let's work with this. So obviously, it passes through the origin. So the y-intercept is 0. So it will be of the form y is equal to mx. Right? And the slope... I can find from this, these two points. So M will be minus 2K minus 2 by minus 1, which is 2K plus 2. So Y will be 2K plus 2 times X. Um, I, I hope I got the values correct, right? 2K plus 2 
times x minus was it two it was it zero i'm not sure if this was zero let's see two k x Oh, right, it is correct. Yeah, no problem. So if I take two common k plus one x, so two times k plus one x, so option A is the right answer. Yeah, the values were not written properly because this is like a screenshot of the QAs, right? So until we have a proper PDF version, version we'll have to kind of make do with this. So this seems to be um, option A, yeah. Okay. So let's choose A. Yeah, okay. Object A has a mass of X kilograms. Object B has a mass of 1.1 X kilograms. What is the ratio of the mass of object A to the mass of object B? Okay, so this would be uh, mass mass of A to mass of B would be X by 1.1 X, which is one by 1.1, which is 10 to 11. So it will be 10 to 11, right? Option D, okay. Now the next one, the volume of the right triangular prism uh, shown is 96 cubic centimeters. What is the area in centimeters squared of so one of the triangular bases of the prism? So this is like a body, right? Which rises straight. So the area, the volume of the prism would be the area of the base multiplied by the height, right? That's always true for any body that rises upward straight. Like for example, for a cylinder, the volume is pi r squared h because pi r squared is the area of the base and h is the height, right? Um, if it's not rising straight, but converging to a point, then it's one third, which is why for a cone, it's one third pi r squared h because it's converging. So here the body is rising straight, right? So the volume is 96. The area of the base is what we have to find and the height is 12. So the area is 96 by 12. 12, fives are 60, 12, sixes are 12, sevens are 84, 12, eights are 96. So the area of one of the triangular bases is eight, option B. Okay, um, the dot plots show the distribution of heights in inches of members from four basketball teams of the data set summarized, which has the smallest standard deviation. So standard deviation is the spread of the data from the mean, how much the data is spread from the mean, what is the deviation from the mean, right? So. The, way, the data, if it is spread out, right? Which means that if, for example, option B, um, every data point is separate, right? So here, the if suppose the mean is, let's say 71, it's just a supposition, I don't know the exact mean, then the standard deviation would be the highest here because every point is separate and it's spread out from the mean. And here the standard deviation would be the lowest because there are one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six values at the same data point, right? So six students or six players had the same height of 72. So the bunching near the mean is higher, right? So if my mean is um, six, it's actually the mean is going to be 72 here, right? Because there are 72 value, like six values, 72, and then one value 68 and one value 76. So the mean would be 72. So the spread from the mean, the deviation from the mean is the lowest here. And so the smallest standard deviation is option D. Okay. 
Sanjay works as a teacher's assistant for $20 per hour and tutors privately for $25 per hour. Last week, he made at least $100 working X hours as a teacher's assistant and Y hours as a private tutor. Which of the following inequalities models this situation? So how much did he earn from the X hours as a teacher's assistant? Uh, that would be 20x because per hour he gets 20. And how much he earned earning from private, from the y hours of private tuition? That would be uh, 25y, right? So his total earnings, total earnings are 20x plus 25y. And he made at least $100, which means that this has to be greater than equal to 100, at least 100, so 100 or higher. So this is my inequality. Now I can take uh, five common from both sides. So if I take five common here, I'll get 4x plus 5y is greater than equal to 100. And if I take five to the right hand side, I'm left with 20 here. So 4x plus 5y should be greater than or equal to 20. And that is option B. Right. Okay. The total cost C in dollars to tie the square flow is represented by the equation C is equal to 16L squared where L is the length of one side of the floor in feet. Which of the following represents the cost in dollars per square foot to tile the floor? So let's say this is my uh, floor, right? Um, and the total cost to tile a square floor is represented by uh, 16L squared, where L is the length of one side of the floor. So what is the cost in dollars per square foot to tile the floor? So what is the area? The area of the floor is L square, right? So for L square area, I'm paying 16 L square dollars. So for one, uh, one square foot area, I would be paying 16 L squared by L squared, which is $16. So per square foot, my cost would be $16, which is option C. Okay. Now, uh, 26. The given equation models the number of three credit hour courses X and the number of four credit hour courses Y that Camilla can take for a total of 16 credit hours next semester, which graph models the equation. So we can just work from, so let me write it here, 3X plus 4Y is 16. Uh, yeah, right, I'll write this here. 3x plus 4y is 16, right? So let's start with the intercepts. So my x intercept, I can find when I put y as 0. So 3x is 16. So x is 16 by 3. So my x intercept would be 5.33, comma 0. So that's my x intercept. And my y intercept would be 4y is 16, so y is 4, so my y intercept is 0, 4. Now I just have to uh, figure out which one is, so x intercept, 5.33 is possible, and 4 here is correct. So a looks like a good answer. y intercept, this is wrong. Um, C, the y intercept is again wrong. And D also, the intercepts are wrong, right? So the one which has the correct intercepts of 5.33 and 4 is option A. So let's choose option A. 
Okay. Question 27. The interstate route from Los Angeles, California to Jacksonville, Florida cost about $5 billion total to build and has a total distance of about 2,500 miles. Each mile of the route uh, costs about $2 million to build. If the linear relationship between the distance in thousands of miles and the cost in billions of dollars is represented in the XY plane, what is the y-intercept of the graph? So you can see that uh, the there was the total cost. The total cost was five billion dollars, right? And the total distance is twenty five hundred miles. So, and each mile cost $2 million. So what is the total cost for laying the road, laying the highway? That would be 2,500 times uh, two, uh, 2 million, right? 2,500 times 2 million. So that's going to be uh, five, 2,500 into two, 5,000 million, which is basically 5 billion, right? And that's the total cost that's given to us, which means that there was no initial cost of, um, you know, setting it up of buying the equipment or whatever. We are assuming that the cost is only the cost of laying the road. So the graph for this will pass through the origin, right? There is no initial cost. There's no y-intercept because whatever is the cost of laying the road turns out to be the total cost. So the y-intercept is simply going to be the uh, origin, 0, 0, so that's option A. Uh, yeah, so let's just choose A. Okay, the populations in thousands of Alaska and Hawaii from 1960 to 2015 can be modeled by the functions A and H, where X is the number of years since January 1, 1960. So X is the number of years since January 1, 1960, and X is between zero and 55, and this is the populations. Based on the model, what is the predicted population of Alaska on January 1, 1960? So we know that uh, January 1, 1960 is when we start the graph, right? So when X is zero, the value of Y would simply be 221, right? And this would be 221,000 because the population is in thousand. So the predicted population of Alaska is option D, 221,000. Okay. Uh, question 29, the same question, based on the model in which year does the predicted population of Hawaii first exceed 900,000? So the predicted population of Hawaii is uh, 645 plus 14.5x, and that has to be greater than 900. I'm taking 900 and not this thousand part because the population is in thousands in this uh, function, right? So I'm just taking 900. So 14.5x has to be greater than, uh, what would this be? 255, right? 900 minus 645 is 255. So X has to be greater than 255 by 14.5. And if I plug that into the calculator, 255 divided by 14.5, that becomes 17.6. So X has to be greater than 17.6. Now, I started, uh, in 1960, and I want the population to exceed, which means that I will have to 
add 18 to this, right? Because to be greater than 17.6, the next integer is 18. So the year when the population will first exceed 900,000 in Hawaii would be 1978, right? Which is not an option. So what mistake have we made? Uh, does the predicted population first in, uh, exceed? Can be modeled uh, since January 1, right? So if I'm looking at January 1, one year would be January 1, 61. And 17 years would be January 1. In which year? Right, right. So it would exceed in 77, not 78. Right. That's a good problem, right? I'm glad they didn't give 78 as an answer. Because the, see, the thing is that 17.6 years is 1977, right? That year because it's still that year that's running, right? So within that year, the population will exceed. I don't have to go up to 1978 first Jan because the population exceeds 900,000 before that. So D is a good answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, Question 30, a psychologist conducting a memory experiment provided participants with a list of three letter sequences. Immediately after the experiment, the participants remembered 100% of the sequences. The psychologist found that the percentage of sequences the participants remember decreased by 30% for every three second interval that time passed. Which function best models this situation where P is the percentage of sequences the participants remembered and T is the time in seconds that passed? Okay. So the exponential formula is a times uh, is p times uh, growth factor to the power t over k, where uh, p is the initial value, right? So here they remembered hundred percent of the sequences initially. So this is hundred. Um, the growth factor is what, how much did they remember after the time interval? So it decreased by 30%. So one minus 30 over 100, one minus 0.3. So growth factor is 0.7. And K is the interval, right? In which this change happened. So K here is three. So the function would be uh, A is 100 times 0.7 to the power t by 3. Because every 3 seconds, this decrease happened. So that's 100 times 0.7 to the power t by 3, which is option C. Okay. So let's choose this. Okay, now we do the grid questions. The bar graph shows the number of discovered near Earth asteroids by classification as of April 2017. Of the near Earth asteroids, how many more are classified as medium, large, or very large than are classified as very small or small? Okay, so we are looking at medium, large, or very large. So that's 4055 plus 3808 plus 876. That's the first group, medium, large, or very large. And for small or very small, we are looking at 2911 plus 4406. So, and we have to find the difference of the two because we are saying how many more are classified. So let's first find the first value 4055 plus 3808 uh, plus 876. So that's 8739. So this first number is 8739. And the second one is 2911 plus 4406. So this is 7317. 
So the difference is uh, 8739, 8739 minus 7317, which is 1422. So the difference is the answer 1422. Okay, so let's write that here. One, four, two, two. Okay. Mm, the solutions to the given equation can be written in the form m plus minus root k by two, where m and k are integers. What is the value of m plus k? Okay, so this is a quadratic equation. So I have um, x squared minus 4x minus 9 is 0. So to find x, I can use the discriminant formula, which is minus b plus minus under root of b squared minus 4ac by 2a. So here um, b is negative 4, a is 1, and c is negative 9. So this becomes plus 4 plus minus 16 minus 4 into 1 into negative 9 by 2, which is 4 plus minus 16 plus 36 by 2, which is 4 plus minus under root of 52 by 2, right? 36 and 16 is 52. Okay. So then if I compare it to what is given to me, then M has to be 4 and K has to be 52, right? That's what, uh, that is the form in which I've gotten the value of X, um, M plus minus root K by two. So, so M is four and K is 52. So M plus K would be 56. So the answer for this is 56. Let's write 56 here. Okay. 33, what is the result of increasing 300 by 200%, right? So I'm increasing 300 by 200%. So that will be 300 plus 200% 200 of 300. So that's 300 plus two into 300 which is 300 plus 600, which is 900. So increasing 300 by 200% yields 900. So that's my answer. Mm, yeah, so that's 900. Okay. 34, in the system of equations above, k is a constant. If the system has no solutions, what is the value of k? So this represents two lines, right? Two lines. And when will two lines have, uh, when will a system of two lines have no solution? When the lines are parallel and they cannot meet. So if there is no intersection, there is no solution. And when will the lines be parallel? When their slopes are equal. So the slope of this line is three by two and the slope of this line is k by three. So if k by three is equal to three by two, then these lines will be parallel and the system will have no solution. So k is nine by two, right? Or 4.5. So let's write uh, 4.5 for this. 4.5. Yeah. 35, the expression 0.6y represents a result of decreasing the quantity y by p percent. What is the value of p? So y minus p percent of y is 0.6y. So 1 minus p over 100 is 0.6. So p over 100 is 0.4. So P is 40. So if you decrease Y by 40%, you get 0.6 Y. So P is 40. Okay, 36. 
two numbers a and b are each greater than zero and the square root of a is equal to the cube root of b. So the square root of a is equal to the cube root of b for what value of x is a to the power 2x minus 1 equal to b. Okay, so I need to find a to the power 2x minus 1 and that has to be b. So this is a to the power 2x by a has to be b. Does that help me? Mm. Actually, I should first write b in terms of a. So a to the power 1 by 2 is b to the power 1 by 3. So b is a to the power 3 by 2, right? Because if I raise both sides to 3, then b to the power 1 by 3 into 3 is just b and a to the power 3 by 2. So then I should write b as a to the power 3 by 2. So let me do that. Yeah. Uh, so then I have a to the power 2x minus 1 is a to the power 3 by 2. So 2x minus 1 is 3 by 2. So 2x is 3 by 2 plus 1, which is 5 by 2. So x is 5 by 4. So the value of x for which this happens is 5 by 4. Okay, so let's write that 5 by 4. Okay. Questions 37 and 38 refer to the following information. The bar graph sh above shows the total number of scheduled flights and the number of delayed flights for five airlines in a one month period. Okay, scheduled and delayed. Values have been rounded to the nearest 1000 flights. Okay, what is the median number of delayed flights for the airlines? Shown. Okay, so let's first find the values of the delayed flights. So I have, um, do I need to find the exact values or can I just find the middle value, right? Because there are five, so the middle value is third. So these two are the lowest. So the middle value is definitely this one, right? If I put the values in ascending order, the third value would be uh, 5,000, right? It's exactly this value, which is 5,000. So the median is uh, 5,000. Yeah, okay. So let's just write that. This is question 37. So I'll write 5,000 here. Okay. And according to the graph for the airline with the greatest number of delayed flights, what fraction of the total number of scheduled flights for the airline were delayed? So the greatest number of delayed flights is airline B, right? It has 15,000 delayed flights and the total schedule was 40,000. So what fraction? It would be 15,000 divided by 40,000. So five threes are 15, five eights are 40. So it's three by eight. The number of the fraction of the flights that were delayed is th uh, three by eight. Okay, so that was the no cal section. Let us now grade it. Sorry, that was the cal section. Uh, let's grade it now. I have the answer key with me. Yeah, so let's go to math cal. Okay, B, A, D, C, B, B, A, D, uh, C, sixth, B, wait, B, A, D, C, B, right? Fourth is C, yeah. Where is number five? Yeah, five is here, B. Okay, B, A, D, C, B. Um, yeah, D, D, C, C, B. So D, D, uh, C, C, B, 10th, okay. 
A A C B C A A C B C sixteen D B C D A D B C D A twenty one D B D B C D B D B C K twenty six A A D D C A A D D C okay thirty one one I'll just put it back here one second mm, yeah thirty one one four two two fifty six nine hundred four point five forty five by four five thousand and three by eight okay great so we got all correct. Hope this exercise was useful. Um, I'm trying to do this today itself because I know that a lot of you are taking the SAT tomorrow. So this might be useful for you. Um, I would also like to do the English portion today, but the English files are not um, very conducive to solving live because they are screenshots. So I'm trying to see if something can be done about that. Um, I would like to have the PDFs in the standard format because that would make it simple. So let's see if I'm able to upload something, maybe writing. I'll do that before uh, tomorrow. Hope this was useful. If it was, hit like and subscribe to the channel. I'll see you guys in a new video soon. Take care. Bye-bye.